It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you to the worship team, the tech team, everybody. Uh, wonderful, wonderful worship this morning. I choose to praise and glorify the name of all names. What a, what a wonderful song to lead us into the throne today. It's the day we celebrate the dads in our lives. Some are earthly, some father figures, some spiritual fathers. Happy Father's Day. I'm so thankful for the fathers. My earthly father, my father-in-law who's with the Lord now. And all the men that have invested in me. Happy Father's Day. I'm so thankful. We have a special day planned, not because I'm here. <laughs> um, we have our team that's in Oaxaca, Mexico right now doing vacation Bible sports camp. And so we've got 11 people down there just ministering for the Lord. Three of our pastors are there. And uh, just so continue to pray for them. And uh, you get to, to hear from God through me today. And I just count it a privilege to do that. But we also have a special guest the Walker family is here. Cody and Millie Walker with Haley and Luke, if you guys want to stand up. I'm getting a little ring to... Uh... Welcome from Argentina. And uh, Cody's going to present here just a few minutes just to tell what God has been doing over the last four years. Uh, and just, uh, just exciting to, to hear how God is using them and moving them in ways that they never even expected. Uh, so, so we look forward to that. But before that, we're going to have a video so you guys can actually see the work that God is doing in Argentina.
Welcome, Cody. I'm excited about getting a second opportunity to do this this morning because round one didn't go as planned. So if you guys got a chance to see the video this morning, they weren't able to see the video because of technical difficulties and things like that. But that's just kind of the way the weekend has been going. But I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to you guys for your prayers, for your support. We wouldn't be in Argentina where we're at right now if it weren't for you guys and churches like you guys that have been praying for us, that have been supporting us, that are sending us out. So uh, for me and my family, we are extremely grateful to you guys for everything that you do for us, even though we're a million miles away, it seems like. But um, you kind of got to see in that video there a little progression of what the last four years has been like. When I sit down to do that video, it was almost impossible to, to pick and choose what pictures to put in through there just to kind of show because you have four years worth of work that the Lord has done in our hearts and through the ministry there in Argentina and it wasn't an easy task but I am uh, grateful that uh, you guys sang that song this morning um, let me tell you about my Jesus you know we've been away that's that's a, the first time I had heard that song was when we came back at our missions conference a couple weeks ago and because of you guys prayers and support I can say that there are lives in Argentina that have heard about your Jesus and whose lives are changed because of the word of God. So just a little bit about who we are. Um, Millie and I met in Bible school. When I turned 18, I jumped on a plane and went to Bible school in Argentina. That's where I learned Spanish. Um, we came back to the U.S. in um, 2007, and slowly God opened up the path for us to come to a little church here in Kansas City in Lee Summit, at Lee Summit Baptist Temple. And there we took on some training. Um, God took us through basically 12 years of training at LSVT in different places. We were in Honduras for a time. We lived a year in Mexico. And then we did four years of deputation. And in 2018, God put our family on a plane, as you saw there, and packed up all our stuff that we, that we had to our name in a container and sent that down to, to Argentina. And when Pastor Fred came up to me the first time and said, you know, have you guys ever considered going to Argentina as missionaries? I kind of laughed because, you know, a missionary is not supposed to go home to do, to do mission work. You know, you're supposed to go somewhere far away, somewhere you don't know. But God took us, I think, to the place where he would have us to be because we have a lot of advantages of being there. And so as we were looking at where in Argentina does God want to send us, we decided to try and go to the places where not all the missionaries were going. So, you know, all the missionary books tell you to target, you know, population where there's people at so you can go. So we said, well, we'll go to the second largest city in Argentina. It's Córdoba. It's a place we had been to before we had visited. We knew a little bit about it. Um, but basically, Millie grew up in Buenos Aires, which is the big city. It's 14 million people. You know, it's, it's a lot of movement. But that's where all the missionaries generally end up. So we wanted to go somewhere that was kind of new ground. And so ironically, as soon as we got there, um, about a month into being in Córdoba, we met another missionary who had hit the ground in Córdoba about three or four months before we had gotten there. And so we were talking with, uh, you saw his picture there, missionary David Owens, and we started talking to him, and he had just got to a point where he had enough people, he had rented a, a building, and he was ready to start holding services. We had just gotten to Cordoba. We had just moved into our new house. You guys saw us unloading a piano and everything that we, we unloaded there at, the, at our new house in the basically the center of the city. And the church he was starting was about an hour's bus ride northwest of the city. And so we said, David, is there anything that we can do to help you get the ground running, you know, to, to get started, to get some traction? And he said, well, I don't have any musicians in my church. I don't know how we're going to do with the music. And so a couple of weeks before he got started, we got together, and I said, well, I can bang on, on the guitar a little bit. You know, if that's useful to you, then, you know, we can help you out with that until you guys can get some people to transition into that. And so as we went and started helping this missionary out, and we started canvassing different areas around in the city to see where God would have us to be, that turned into almost a full year of us trying to get traction in certain places and, and trying to just walk around the city. I think we walked through two or three pairs of shoes walking around the city, discovering where it was that God would have us to be, why we were helping this missionary start his church. So all those pictures you guys saw with the, um, the, the wooden background in that church, that was uh, one of the first churches that we helped another missionary start, why we were there, why we were looking for the place that God would lead us inside the city. And then you saw some pictures up there that said Villa Allende Neighborhood. And, you know, some pictures that had some trees and things like that. When we started targeting an area, we thought, okay, all the missionary books tell you you need to target the area of the city that's growing. 
So the northwest city towards the mountains is the area that the city is growing. And said, we're going we're gonna to target Villa Allende. That's where we want to go. So we started canvassing. We started trying to um, you know, talk to people. We started you know, doing everything that we were told that we were supposed to do to be able to start a church. And somebody would get saved, and then all of a sudden they, they would do like a lesson of discipleship, and then they wouldn't want to do anymore, or they would fall off the map, or they would move. We tried to get a house, rent a house in that area, and every time we would go to sign the contract for the house, they would rent it to somebody else the night before. I mean, stuff like, you're like, this just doesn't happen. What is going on here? And so we were getting frustrated. We're like, well, Lord, we've been trying to do this for a year. We were trying to get traction. We've been trying to get something. We know that you've brought us here. We know that you've brought us to Argentina. But where would you have us to start this church? You know, we, we told all of our supporting churches back there in the U.S. that we didn't have to learn the language and that we could just hit the ground running and we could get started. And then a year later, we're thinking, what do we have to show for it? You know, we're helping another guy start a church. We weren't doing, it's not like we weren't doing anything. But, Lord, we came here for you to start a church here. So what is it you would have us to do? So we were getting frustrated. And so I called up a pastor friend of mine who, he's an Argentine pastor, and he happened to be our Bible school professor while we were down there. And he said, well, why don't you guys come to the town that I'm living in right now? He had stopped being a Bible school professor. He went back to his home church, basically where he grew up in, and he went back to pastor that church for about eight years. And then his church sent him to another church um, that was struggling, that was dying, to try and revive that church and see if, you know, maybe the Lord could use him to, you know, get some energy back in a church in a town called Miramar. You guys saw a big picture of the, of the sign, the city of Miramar. He said, why don't you guys come out here just for a couple of days, take a break, get some rest, and just maybe, you know, maybe the Lord will give you some, um, some direction. And so we went out to Miramar, we were talking with him, and he said, you know, you guys are telling me that you wanted to go to a place where there's not other missionaries working. You guys wanted to go break ground in a new place. You wanted to go where other people weren't doing the work. He said, I want you to drive down 10 kilometers south of here is a town called Balnearia. I said, I just want you to drive around Balnearia and count how many churches that you see. Okay, all right, we'll do that. So we drive into Balnearia. We're driving down the streets, you know, kind of it's, it's on a grid pattern. It's really easy to get around. We're driving around. It's a town of about 10,000 people. And the only church we could find was the Catholic Cathedral, the Catholic Parish, and a, Je a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. And we came back, you know, that afternoon, that evening, and we're, you know, we're telling him, he said, well, what churches are there in Balnearia? He says, there's not one church in a town of 10,000 people. There is no one taking the gospel to the people in Balnearia. There is no one that is praying for the people of Balnearia. He said, a guy about a couple months ago um, that works in a, um, in a shop there in town, I witnessed to him and he got saved. Why don't you guys go talk to him? So we went and we talked to Omar and we just, we just asked him, we said, you know, Omar, you've been saved here for a couple of weeks, but what kind of needs, you know, if God were to bring and start a church here in Balnearia, what would be the needs of the people in Balnearia that God could use a church here in their lives? And he just started talking to us about the things that were going on in his life, the things that were going on in his family life, the things that were going on around the city, the different ministries that were needed, the different outreaches that were needed, and the, the need for the people of Balnearia to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we said, Lord, nobody's here. If you would have us to go here, you're going to have to open a door. I called Pastor Fred. I said, all the missionary books tell you to go to the big cities where there's a lot of population. We have a possibility and opportunity of a place over here where there's no one reaching out to these people. Pastor Fred said, well, see if God opens a the door there. So we started to look around just to see if there was a house to rent, a place where we could stay. Within a month, we had already signed a contract on a place that we could stay that was three times the size where we were at, at half the price. And God opened up a door for us a place to, to have a, a, a the, our, not only our house, but there was a room on the property to grow into a church later on, a, a church building. And so that was the first door that God started opening up. And then as we were there, um, you know, you guys saw the, the video of us packing up from the big city of, of Cordoba and moving to the small town of Balnearia. We get there in February of 2022, and in March, the pandemic hit. And I don't know if you guys... No, but Argentina had one of the longest lockdowns and some of the most restrictive um, lockdowns of any country anywhere in the world, really. And we're honestly just two months coming out of the mask mandates and, and a lot of things. We couldn't drive from one town to the other without written permission from the government to give us permission to be able to just drive from one town to the other. And um, so whenever we, you know, we're, we're sitting there in March and our kids had gone to school, I think, for two weeks. You saw some pictures of Luke with his teacher there. And then, you know, we had to go back to the house, and everybody who told us that, you know, homeschool, that, that's kind of weird. Why are you guys doing homeschool? Then they had to, all their kids were then homeschooled after that, just, you know, by, 
by the government forcing them to, to have to do school in their house. And so it was interesting that, you know, people would, would call us and be like, how do you do this? And so that was an open door to kind of get into some, some people's homes. And so we started thinking, Lord, you know, you brought us here to this town. A month into it, we, we don't know anybody here. We don't even know where the grocery stores are or where things are going. How are we going to start a church in the middle of a pandemic whenever we're supposed to be out, you know, taking tracks to people? We're supposed to be out knocking on doors. We're supposed to be out making contacts. We're supposed to be out making relationships. I can't hold any kind of event. I can't do anything that all the missionary strategies tell you you're supposed to do to be able to get people together to start a church. So, Lord, how am I going to do this? So we started seeing that God was bringing people to us. I don't know if you guys had this here, but we had something that was called essential workers. And so these are people that have to come to your house to bring you your food. They have to come to your house to bring you your, your propane tank so that you can heat your home and so that you can cook. They have to come to your house to bring you your water. And then, so we started targeting the essential workers that were coming to our house. And we started making relationships and building relationships with those guys and getting to know them and get to know their families. And then through them, we would make a contact from another contact. And they would give us, hey, why don't you call this guy if you need this and you need that. And so it was literally we had to sit back and watch how God began to bring people into place so that we could start the church. I can honestly stand before you here and say it was absolutely nothing that we did. It was nothing that we could have done because we were told to sit in our houses and not go out and not talk to anybody. But it was literally the only thing we could do was sit down, strap in, and watch how God started bringing people to, into contact with us. And those people were the future of the church. You guys saw a, a picture there of, of a baptism. And there was a family there, um, a, a family of four, one of the very first pictures after the baptism. They were standing up after they were baptized. The lady in that picture, her name is Letty. And I'll just tell you a little bit about their family and, and how they came to be and how important they are for our church. And then I'll be done and, and I'll let you guys continue on with your service. But Letty um, actually got saved whenever she was a teenager in the town 10 miles or 10 kilometers north of where we are in the town of Miramar, where our pastor friend is, well, was at the time pastoring a church there. And so she came to know the Lord at a young age, but, you know, as she grew up, life gets in the way. She stepped away from the Lord. And all the conveniences of, you know, having to get up and, and go to town, go to a town 10 kilometers away to try and go to church, she just slowly drifted away from the Lord. But the whole time, she had been wanting and desiring a church in her town, in Balnearia, so that she could have somewhere to go to church. At the point that we met Leti, uh, she was a single mom. She had two young teenage kids. They're 18 and 16 now. And we got a, a phone call and said, you know, you know, I'm, my name is Letty. I live here in town. I hear you guys are starting a church. Could I come? Yeah, you can come. We'd love for you to come. And so she started coming. She was one of the very first people that started coming. And <clears throat> what we did is in the middle of all the lockdowns and everything, when they told us that nobody could get together, about three or four months into that, they told us, okay, well, you can get together with family members, no more than 10 people. You have to be separate. You have to wear a mask. You have to do all of the all of the stuff that you have to do to be able to get together, but no more than 10 people and only family members. We looked at each other and we said, well, we're the family of God. Why can't we get together? And so we decided we're going to hold church services. We're going to open it up for anyone that, that, that wants to come. We're not going to force anybody to come. We don't, we don't, we don't want to get anybody get sick or anything like that. But if you want to come and you want to hear the word of God, we're going to be, our family is going to get together on Sunday morning and we'll open the Bible. If you want to come hear the Bible, you can come be a part of our family. So Letty was one of the very first people that came with her two, um, with her two kids to come to that, that type of a service in the middle of lockdown. She said, if we get fined, we'll just pay the fine. If we get, you know, whatever they do to us, we're going to open up the opportunity for people to come and hear the word of God. And so she starts coming. She starts going to discipleship with Millie. We start discipleship with both of her two young kids. And we start to see God work in Letty's life. She's a single mom, you know. Everybody can understand, you know, all the, the things that are going on through her mind. And then a couple months later, we met Brian. And Brian and her had been dating for a time before. And Brian had actually gone to the church in Miramar when he was a young man. That's where they met. That's where they were both saved uh, whenever they were, when they were younger. But they had also kind of drifted apart. You know, they weren't really talking to each other until Letty started coming to church with us. And Brian started calling her up on the phone. And, and she, said, she called him and told him one day, you know what, I'm going to church now. This is the direction that I want to take my life and I want to take my kids. If you want to have any kind of relationship in the future, then you need to start coming to church with me. So we met Brian. We went out to, and, and ate lunch with him one night. To make a long story short, 
Brian gets involved in discipleship. He gets uh, plugged into the church. He starts growing in the Lord. And Brian and Letty were the first couple in our ministry that we've ever married. And the first couple in our church that got married. And now Brian is the guy that's coordinating pretty much everything for me while we're here and while, you know, while, while they're there. This morning I called him up. We did a Zoom call into our church this morning and did the service. And, you know, because we were here this morning, he had to kind of do the, all the, the songs and everything on his own. He's my, my, my music guy, you know. He's, he helps. I just play on the guitar, and he, he leads all of the worship and does all the beginning part of the service for me. So he had to do all that on his own this morning. They've, uh, they've taken on uh, the, the youth services. They've taken on some of the Wednesday night teaching, which is something new for them because they had never prepared a lesson for anybody. So this has kind of been a good learning and growing experience for them as well, us coming up here when the church is, is still kind of so young, and then having to take on a lot of responsibilities that they didn't have to do before. So I'm really grateful that um, God has used his word in their lives and has built them up and prepared them and got them to a point where now they're the ones that are taking on responsibility, and they're the ones that are excited about taking that new step. And there, I've got two ladies in the church that have like one or two lessons of discipleship, one to finish up before we can go to discipleship two. And they're the ones that are like, come on, guys, you need to finish up your discipleship lesson so that we can all get in discipleship two. So they're excited about learning the word of God. They're excited about the next step that God has for them in their faith journey. And you guys have been a huge part of that getting them to where they are now so that they can continue to serve the Lord in Argentina. And I just want to give you guys a, a special thanks. I didn't throw any pictures up there in the, in the video. I didn't think to do it. But um, when Dylan came down in 2019, you guys sent an extra suitcase of baseball equipment down with Dylan. And we have used that so much down there during the summers. As soon as they said in the summers, okay, everybody go out and, you know, get some exercise and go do some things. You know, we got, well, we got all this baseball equipment that Dylan brought down. So what if we just go out to the park and just start playing baseball? And people showed up, and they call us on the phone, and, hey, when are you guys going to play baseball again? And so it's been a great tool for us to use as outreach into our community. And this little town of Balnearia where we weren't supposed to even be at, and God is growing a church through you guys' support of us being down there. So we're grateful. Thank you. Pastor Dylan. Well, thank you, Cody. What you don't know is often in my sermons, there's a reference somewhere to chili dogs, and there was one in the video. I hadn't worked it into the sermon, but it's, there was one in the video, so thank you for that, all right? Thank you, though. It's great to hear what God is doing in Argentina, missions, family, and sports. That's what we do around here, and uh, what a testimony of those in Oaxaca right now taking vacation to Bible sports camp to, uh, to Oaxaca and then also them being able to use baseball equipment uh, that we sent. Thank you. All right. Well, happy Father's Day once again. We celebrate all the dads in our lives. You know, today fathers are needed more than ever. Whether that be earthly fathers or father figures or spiritual fathers, they're needed more than ever. So make sure today to tell the, the men in your life, those father figures, your father, tell them thank you. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that you value them, that you respect them. Today is a day to celebrate then. And then obviously take some time to tell your perfect heavenly father how much you love him and are thankful for him. Well, since I don't get to preach that often, and since it's Father's Day, I got some pictures. Well, these are nice pictures. All right. I, I won't embarrass anybody. This is the whole Allen clan, the legacy of Fred and Linda Allen. Uh, my brother's side of the family on one and, and then our side of the family on the other. This is their legacy. And I'm so thankful uh, that I had a father that taught me to love the Lord and to love people. I'm so thankful. And then the next one. These are the ones that made me a dad. Got, a, got a three of them here today. Brittany and Tabitha and Libby and Thad. Uh, so they, they're all kind of sitting over here behind Teresa today. Uh, those are the ones that, that call me dad. Um, I'm so thankful to be your father. So thankful. Man, I'm not supposed to be emotional, right? 
It's been such a joy to see you grow up and to be successful and to love the Lord and to love people. I just, I'm so thankful. And then finally, a picture of our whole gang. Now, obviously, Teresa gets a whole lot of more credit than I do for all of this, but that's the whole gang with the, with the husbands too. Three of the husbands right here, Tyler and Nick and Wale. We're so thankful for them. Uh, and then we have two granddaughters, Mia and Emmy. I get to be called Poppy now. And there's nothing like hearing the little whisper, Poppy, I love you. Oh, man. So, so wonderful. So anyway, that's all of us. I'm just so thankful to be a dad and a poppy. I'm grateful to be a spiritual dad as well uh, to people. And um, uh, what, a, what a fun opportunity to preach here on Father's Day. But enough about me. Let's, let's jump in uh, to today's message. I'm just going to run through three characteristics of godly fathers. Pretty simple message. Um, I'll try to talk fast in case you got lunch plans and you got to beat the other churches somewhere. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, but let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, here, the Apostle Peter, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, he writes these two letters. Um, and this letter here was written from Rome, and it was sent uh, to multiple church communities uh, of mostly non-Jewish Christians. We, knew, we know that he had served Jewish Christians for a while. Uh, this was later in life, and he was, he was really ministering to mostly non-Jewish Christians. And in this letter, he covers the identity that we have in Christ through being born again, the suffering that we have as Christians. He talks about authority and submission and gives practical advice to husbands and wives and pastors. And in the middle of this letter, in the context of suffering, we have this passage that we're going to look at today. He gives some basic commands in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. And while this application is for everyone in the audience, today I'm going to pick on the fathers and the men. I mean, you, 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 you mothers and kids, you know, take care of them later. Let them relax, watch the golf tournament or nap through the golf tournament. You know, let, let them eat and all that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll bring the heat now. You guys can take care of them later, all right? So sorry, guys, if you wanted an easy, relaxing message, all right? So let's jump in. Let's read these verses right here. Uh, we got to, uh, right here in First Peter. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. And then here's the verse where we'll camp out on today. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And let me pray uh, once again real quick. Father, I thank you that we can be in your house, that we can just be in your presence and consider your word and be challenged from your word. And I just ask that the things that are said here would bring honor to you. Thank you for being such an amazing father, a giving father, a loving father. And may the fathers in this room follow in your steps. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. I'm just going to break these into three points instead of four. I'll, I'll use the first and last ones together for time's sake. Honor all men and honor the king. So, three applications for fathers. These are characteristics of godly fathers. Characteristics of godly fathers. The first one, godly fathers give honor to all. Godly fathers give honor to all. And I'll start with that last one about honoring the king. I'll just hit it real briefly. Honor those that are in authority. Honor those that are in authority. And that most certainly includes the ones that you don't agree with. He said, honor the king. Be like Daniel in today's Babylon. Daniel, this, this Israelite that had been enslaved and was forced to change his name, forced to learn a pagan religion, forced to, to 
serve underneath the rule of just some wicked kings, but he gave them honor. And God blessed him for that. We need more people that will just honor those positions, those people in authority. God called us to do that. You might not like them. You may disagree with them. You may not like their political stance and their motives, their actions, their treatment of you. But God said, give them a place of honor. So that's just a little snippet there for that part. All right. Now, how about this? Honor all men honor all we've got to give honor to all let's go a little bit deeper give everyone respect give them some reverence regardless of their race or their social status or their education or their religion their lifestyle their gender their political leaning give them honor the last time i checked we were created in the image of god something special that deserves honor God made us. We should honor one another. It's, it's just a, amazing to me that God loved us and honored us enough to send us his only begotten son. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, for me and for you. How can we not return that honor to those that he has created? Honor everyone. The command is pretty simple, fathers. And let me not exclude the rest of you as well. Honor all men. When you do that, when you really give someone honor, and maybe they don't deserve that honor, but you give it to them, the impact that you can have on them is immeasurable. The effectiveness that you can have on someone you're giving honor to You just never know what God can do. You're going to be able to minister to people that aren't like you. It's easy to minister to someone that loves the same things we love, that looks just like us. God said, give honor. You need to reach more than people that just look like you and that have the same social status as you, right? My brothers and sisters, do you have a reputation as a man or a woman of honor do you really honor other people serve them sacrifice your needs for theirs and we've got some passages there let's take a look romans chapter 12 verse 10 says be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another preferring one another we'll look at the first half of the verse in point number two but this one preferring one another attitudes of kindness giving preference to others sacrificing for your brothers and sisters sacrificing giving honor honoring people with good manners good communication edification encouragement praying for them in the greek this phrase preferring one another has the connotation of leading the way you show others how to honor someone else by the actions that you take lead the way fathers are you leading the way when it comes to honoring people are you leading the way audience are you taking a step forward and showing honor to people do you show all people honor how about this next one first corinthians 12 beautiful chapter about the body of christ and it says those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need for this honor but god hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked do you give honor to the less comely as the verse says to the least of these as jesus said those that have nothing they can give you in return do you show honor to those people god bestows honor on people that we least expect he did it in scripture right the widow that gave her two mites no one even noticed her but he poured out honor on her and we all know about her because jesus recognized her the woman with the alabaster box the the little boy with the loaves and fishes 
How about those that volunteer to clean the church? God bestows honor on them. Honor on them. Those nursery workers, whoo, man, holding them crying baby. Sometimes the baby will cry the whole time they're in there so that we can be in here and hear the word of God. Those quiet prayer warriors, some of those retirees that just will give money every single week so that kids can go to youth camp. That's who God bestows honor on those. You know, the pastors, the ministry leaders, the, the people on stage, hey, we get a lot of praise. That's okay. But don't be surprised when God hands out rewards that there's going to be a whole lot of people that we least expected that get the most honor. The most honor. Fathers, do you look down on people? Or do you give honor to the unpopular, the lesser talented, the less mature? Do you show them honor? My brothers and sisters, everyone deserves honor. Honor all men. What a simple command. Another verse. This one's just for the husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered that's a pretty powerful verse husbands do you truly honor your wife i mean god made it crystal clear in this verse that you should be honoring your wife so much so that he said your prayers would be hindered if you don't that's pretty amazing wow We've got some amazing, amazing wives in this room, amazing women all around this church. They constantly they lay down their lives for their husbands and their children and their friends and others. Husbands, they deserve honor. Men, they deserve honor. Honor. And men, you need to be the ones to set the example. You're commanded, if you're, if you're married, you're commanded to love your wife the way that Christ loved the church it's not an option you're commanded to do that show her honor sacrifice be unselfish serve her now i want to jump on you guys for a second make sure your wives you take care of the husbands children make sure you take care of your dads all that right husbands if you really want to honor your wives start every day by going to them and asking them, what can I do to serve you? What can I do to meet your needs? Because I want to honor you, and I want to treat you the way Christ has treated the church. I want to live like that. What can I do to help you? Man, start that way. Start your days that way. You're going to have a whole lot better marriage, I guarantee you, if you serve your wife, if you strive to serve your wife. And then if she does tell you something, hey, I, I really could use you to switch the laundry over and do the dishes. We'll actually do it. Don't just, you know, listen, but follow up with that, right? Follow up with that service. A real man's going to lay down his life for his wife. There's not a guy in here that wouldn't, wouldn't take a bullet for his wife. But will you lay down your everyday life, the things that you want to do for your wife? Sacrifice, serve, honor your wife. If your wife is suffering, it is your responsibility to take on that suffering. That's what Christ did for us, right? Your hobby your game console, politics and sports and all of that, whatever it is that you love to do is way down on the priority list when it comes to making sure your wife has honor. So husbands do that. God told you to give you honor. No more excuses. It's on you. Be God's man. All right, have I stepped on your toes already? Take it up to God. All right. The last one here for, in, in our showing honor let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in the word and in doctrine. I'm so thankful for, for the men that I've had in my lives, the women that I've had in my lives that have just poured into me the word of God and taught me how to be uh, the right kind of man. 
double honor, the, the word says here. I mean, look around this building. I mean, it's a great facility, but really look around at the church, the people, the people that make up the church. And consider the last 10 years. I mean, this place has run so well. So many people are being taught God's word right now. Here and all around this building. Every room in this facility is being used. The sports park, it, it hosts hundreds and hundreds of people. This afternoon, 70 to 80 men are going to be up there playing softball in the heat. Thanks, I'll be on Branson. And they will be hearing the word of God during their devotion time. Every single week, they hear the gospel. What an amazing thing to see. God use these fields, this property for his glory. Like I said earlier, missions, family, sports, that's what we do. We live faith, we love others, and we declare hope. That's our mission. And all of that has happened over the last 10 years under the leadership of our pastor, Mark Brown. Brownie, as we affectionately call him. A man that God anointed to stand in the gap right here, right now for the last 10 years. I know of no one else in this church that sacrifices more of his life and more of his time than that man. He is worthy of double honor. He is worthy of double honor. And we're going to do just that in a few weeks. Take a look at this. On July the 10th, we're coming up on his 10th anniversary as the lead pastor here at our church. We're going to celebrate in both services. He knows that we're doing it, so it's not a secret, but he just doesn't know what we're going to do. And I think that probably drives him crazy, right? But that's okay. We'll surprise him that day with some fun stuff. Uh, but make sure if you could be here on July the 10th, we're going to celebrate and give double honor to, to the man that God called to be here. All right. Now the second point. Godly fathers give honor to all Godly fathers love God's people. Love the brethren, Peter told them. I won't spend as much time here since our pastor has taken us through a series on love, unconditional love in 1 Corinthians. But here are a few highlights and a few verses. Love dearly God's people. We need your love. You need the love of your brothers and sisters. Not just with words, but with actions that follow that up. We're diverse, yet we're one family. All parts of the church are necessary. 1 Corinthians 12 that we looked at tells us that. The command is straightforward. Love the brethren. Look at these verses here. Romans chapter 12. We looked at this one earlier. The first part of it says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Brotherly love. The next one, 1 Thessalonians 4. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We've been taught through his word. We've been taught through his spirit. We've been taught by pastors and teachers, our disciples, to love one another without hypocrisy, without partiality, and, and always unconditionally expecting nothing in return. That's how we should love one another. The next one, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let's go a little further. God laid his life down for us and he's challenged us to lay down our lives for the brethren. I think the key phrase in this verse is ought to. We ought to. We don't always do that because we're fleshly and selfish sometimes and God is saying you ought to lay down your lives for your brothers and sisters because I laid down my life for you amen this should be a vital part of our Christian walk laying down our lives for God's people and then one more real similar verse beloved if God so loved us we ought also to love one another he even goes on later in this chapter and calls us liars if we say we love God, but don't love our brothers and sisters. That's pretty powerful. Fathers, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do your children hear kindly, affectionate words about your brothers and sisters, or do they hear criticism and backbiting? 
Do they hear you condemn your brothers and sisters or compliment your brothers and sisters? You know, if you look hard enough, you'll find either one of those because we are flawed people. If you look close enough, you're going to find stuff you can criticize about me. But if you look closely enough, you can find things that God is doing in my life that you can say, praise the Lord. Which are we looking for? And what are our children and those around us hearing out of our lips? My brothers and sisters, are you loving and laying down your lives for the brethren? There's always going to be people in need, and we need to be the ones to take the step forward and sacrifice our needs to meet those needs. And then our third point today, godly fathers give honor to all, they love God's people, and then they fear God. We need men, fathers that will fear the Lord. And that means reverence him, stand in awe of him. Give him the position that he deserves as almighty. He is higher than us. He is perfect. He is so good. Revere him. Have, have a, just a beautiful fear of the Lord. And then, you know, really think about this. In order to be a godly father, you actually have to know God. To have the capacity to be a godly father. And that comes through salvation in Christ alone. I love this verse. I, I almost just preached this verse today and just stayed here. It's not on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 everlasting life given by God the Father through the Son and what he did on the cross for us. You know, if you, and if you don't know God, if you're a father and don't know God, there's a godly father, a father God Almighty that wants to rule and reign in your life. Put your trust in him. To be godly, you've got to have him in you. Now, for the Christian fathers in the room, let's camp on this characteristic just for a few moments before we close. I got a few verses there. Proverbs 9, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The fear of the Lord, this reverence for the Lord, putting him in his proper place, it's the beginning of wisdom. Do you want to be wise? Do you want to be a man of wisdom, a woman of wisdom? It starts with the fear of of the Lord it starts with the fear of the Lord a reverence of the God of this universe should be where our Christianity starts every day just thanking him being reverence in his pre reverence in his presence the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom the next one let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man it's our duty to fear him and to follow him and do his commandments. Our expectation, our role, we need to strive for this as men and as women. Fearing him, reverencing him, and following him by obeying him. And then another, this is, this is one from Revelation. Everyone one day, everyone one day will stand before him with fear, with reverence. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Why don't we just do it now? We don't have to wait for eternity. We can reverence him now. Give him the glory that he deserves. Put him in his rightful place. Give him honor. Revere him. Fear him. And then one, one verse, this is just such a beautiful psalm. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Stand in awe of him. He is awesome. He is awesome. Put him in his right place, high above you as king and Lord, the almighty. Fathers, on this Father's Day, do you 
Stand in awe of the Lord. Do your children see you standing in awe of the Lord? Do they see that in your life? Do they know you as a man that worships and fears, loves the Lord, and just is in awe of all that he does? Because they should know that about you. And my brothers and sisters, it's time for all of us to really stand in awe of this great father that we have. Stand in awe. He's blessed us in so many amazing ways. We stand here freely being able to preach, proclaim, listen, worship. Thank you, Father. He's blessed you with so much. We're in the Midwest and this great nation with so much blessing. Thank you, Father. He's given you relationships. Some have wonderful, wonderful marriages, wonderful, wonderful children. Thank God for those things. Stand in awe of how he changed your life. If you know him, stand in awe that he took a sinner like me. And he forgave me. And he made me clean. And he put my past behind me. And he said, I'll never remember your sin again. That ought to make us stand in awe. That ought to make us revere him even more. We should get up, and I don't know if you've been a Christian for 50 years. You ought to get up and say, I'm so glad I met you. I'm so glad I met you. I'm so glad that you changed my life. And it ought to stir you to action, even up until your dying days, that he changed you i want to stand in awe on my deathbed and just be able to say thank you god thank you for loving one like me stand in awe revere him he deserves our worship he deserves our praise look at all that he has done and all that he is doing father stand in awe of this great god we have Ladies that are in this room, stand in awe. Stand in awe of this great God that we have. Not everyone had a great fatherly example. Oh, but we've got Almighty, the perfect Father. And we can stand in awe. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we could be here in your house, that we could worship you, that we could consider your word the word that you've preserved for us all these years that we could listen and hear you talk to us through your spirit and be changed because we were in your presence i thank you for the challenge to me to do these things honoring people and loving my brothers and sisters and then fearing you with such awe and such respect and god may we be those kind of people as christians that do that pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How about stand to your feet?